Mic check what two. It's the Y2K collector and I'm back with an early morning video. And uh, this is in a response to uh, a video that I put out yesterday. So I, I had a conversation talking about um, if it made sense basically to invest in retro games. Does it make sense to buy them? And I had two thought processes when it came to buying retro games. One, the thought process of a collector who enjoyed these games as a child and wanted to relive the nostalgia. And the other thought process was the thought process of someone who understands that these consoles, these systems, and some of the games for these systems hold uh, a good amount of value in terms of what they're worth and what they can be sold for. And um, the common th theme that I get um, whenever I have the conversation about retro games or retro collecting, especially now in 2024, is that the nostalgia um, for these games is tied to the generations that originally had them. So if you are a Gen Xer, if you're someone who's probably in their 40s, maybe you're in your late 30s, early 40s, maybe even 50s, you might have a strong connection to a system like the Nintendo Entertainment System. This is the NES. Now, when you look at a console like the NES, the NES is probably the most iconic console, and it came out probably probably during the most iconic video game era um, because this is the era where household gaming became widespread. Um, this was the era where more people had consoles, video game consoles in their home than ever before, and this is the era that introduced iconic video game characters like Super Mario, Super Metroid, and Zelda. These are characters that have withstood the test of time, and we've seen their growth and maturity throughout all generations of gaming. Um, be that as it may, I do believe that this generation is slowly dying out. Um, I believe that the generation of NES lovers, NES collectors is slowly dying out, but it doesn't take away from how iconic um, the NES is and how iconic that generation was. But in my opinion, and again, this is just my opinion, I think that there's a big difference between the 80s era of gaming and the 90s era of gaming. And the 90s era of gaming is where you saw consoles like the Sega Genesis. Yes, we had the 16-bit, but then we also got the 32X. And then we also had the Super Nintendo. If you're looking for the other versions, there goes your um, 32X and there goes your more traditional or standard Nintendo console. Now, the reason why I feel like these generations are different is because they were able to take all of the iconic aspects of the NES and refine them in a much better, much, much more playable and more importantly, much more beautiful, more aesthetically pleasing way. Um, there are games that we have for both of these systems that even today, when you think in terms of 2D gaming, now I'm never going to compare a 2D sprite-based game to something like Ghost of Tsushima, right? Or Spider-Man 2 for the PS5. Clearly, those are games that have a much higher level of um, graphical uh, or, you know, fidelity. Um, they're much more clearer. They're more realistic. They're in 4K, so I'm never going to compare a 2D based game to a 3D based game. But when you look at it just from the standpoint of 2D gaming, which is something that's still very much alive and well today, we have 2D games <clears throat> that are produced today that are highly coveted, highly sought after. Um, people play them. They enjoy them. I mean, if you think about games like a game like Sea of Stars, Sea of Stars is not some wild 4K amazing 3D game. No, Sea of Stars is a beautifully hand-drawn 3D, not sorry, 3D, 2D rather, sprite-based game. And when you look at that category of gaming, I think that because there is still such a strong market, because there is still such a strong um, constituents of gamers who appreciate that form of gaming, it's those games that keep these systems alive because... Once you start to play a game like Sea of Stars, or if you play any top-down action RPG-based game, you know, you're going to think, man, this game is great. Um, I really enjoy it. 
And naturally, when you find a video game or a genre that you enjoy, you start to explore. You start to see what other games are there out there that are like this. And whenever you do that with a modern retro game that gets released, um, you often try to look back to see, okay, well, what's the basis of this game? Are there other games like it? And usually when you do something like that, you find yourself tracking, backtracking back to these two systems, these two consoles, where we got some of the most iconic video games of all time. Um, a lot of the games that we see today, when you think about a top-down RPG game, even some of the games that have come out for the Switch, when you think about games like Eastward, Crosscode, um, Battle Axe, Sea of Stars, um, all of those games have taken some type of influence from The Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. Now, they might not have taken anything from like the original Zelda. And I, again, I'm talking graphics and gameplay wise, right? Because remember, the Super Nintendo completely refined everything that they were attempting to do on the NES. The graphics were better. The gameplay was better and there were more options because you had four, well, actually six buttons instead of two buttons that you got on the NES. You had more options, you had more buttons, the games were more refined and they looked and felt better. As opposed to the NES, which was yes, the brainchild and the NES sparked a lot of those ideas. It was all refined on the SNES and the Sega Genesis. And so my point is that with until 2D gaming dies completely, until um, people have zero interest in playing a 2D game, whether it be a 2D fighting game, a 2D side-scrolling game, a 2D action game, a 2D RPG game, until that genre completely vanishes, there will always be a market and generations will always harken back to these two consoles because, or even if it's not just these two consoles, but they will harken back to this generation because this is the generation that actually refined those genres and gave us some of the most iconic games from which a lot of these new games are spinoffs from. And even if you want to look at something like the Neo Geo, which I would clump the Neo Geo in the generation of the Genesis and the Super Nintendo, because the Neo Geo was primarily a 2D sprite based game. When you start thinking about games like Metal Slug, Shock Troopers, King of Fighters, those games, again, have spawned off a whole generation uh, and a whole new genre of, of, of games. Um, even if you think back, even if you look at something like Turtles in Time, or if you look at something like uh, a Castlevania, Super Castlevania 4, we're still seeing remakes and, and new releases of games that mimic the gameplay, the art style, and the overall feel of those original games. So when you know, and I and I can definitely understand when someone says, well, hey, you know what, 30 years from now, um, you know, or 50 years from now, th those generations won't give a crap about, um, you know, Genesis games or Super Nintendo games. I'll only believe that if 2D gaming as a whole has completely died off. But as long as there is a group of gamers or a number of gamers who enjoy 2D gaming, who appreciate 2D gaming, who like sprite-based artwork, who like hand-drawn artwork, there will always be that group of gamers who will come back to these two systems or to this generation, the generation which was the inspiration, in my opinion, for many of the 2D classics that we see today. Probably not so much the NES. And even when you think about the NES, there still are games that are released on the Nintendo Switch which harken back to that 8-bit era. When you think about games like The Messenger, when you think about some of the games that are released on the Switch, now granted, there may not be a huge population that looks for those games, but they're still there. However, I think when it comes to the 16-bit and 32-bit era, that era is alive, it's strong, it's kicking, and I think there's still a great number of folks who enjoy gaming that will still go back to these games. Even if it's just because, and, and, I'll, and I'll share this, there was a while where I could not stand playing PlayStation games, N64 games, PS2, PS3 games, because I used to get motion sickness after a while. Like I, There was a point in time where I couldn't play GoldenEye for too long, because if I played GoldenEye too long, I'd wind up getting motion sickness. I felt dizzy because of just the way the camera swiveled. It wasn't as, it just wasn't good. Now, maybe playing Spider-Man on the PS5 is a much better experience because it's 4K, it's it's clearer, it's nicer. 
but you have a good amount of folks who can't play 3D games because they will, in fact, get motion sickness. And so really the only games that they can enjoy are 2D games. Maybe they the only games that they can play is a game of Tetris. So again, not to beat a dead horse, I just kind of wanted to respond to some of the comments that I got on that video. I do in part agree that 50 years from now, most young people will look at this as like the same way we do look at like an Atari 20. I don't even want to look at an Atari 2600. But again, comparing the gameplay of an Atari 2600 to the gameplay of a Super Nintendo, it's not even a fair comparison. That's like that's like comparing like horse and buggy to like the first Ford vehicle that was made. Now, yeah, the first would you want to drive the first Ford, you know, combustion engine that was made? Heck no. But still, the first Ford vehicle that was made is still leaps and bounds ahead of, of a horse and buggy, right? It's just a completely different technology. And when I think about the difference between the tw Atari 2600 and the Super Nintendo, that's what I think. I think Atari, horse and buggy. Super Nintendo, or even if you wanted to say NES, the NES might be the first Ford ever made. And then the Super Nintendo and Genesis is where they start to refine these things and we start to see better versions of the original. It's just my opinion this morning. Um, let me know what you think. Do you agree? Do you believe that the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis era are timeless and will withstand the test of time until gaming ends forever? Or do you think that there is a lifespan um, on these consoles and on this era and that that lifespan is coming to an end at some point? Let me know down in the comments what you think. I think it's a very interesting topic. I'm the Y2K Collector. Hope you're having a good weekend.